Gottes ist herrlich, in einer Zeit zu leben, die ihren Menschen große Aufgaben stellt. Der Mensch lebt nicht vom Brot allein. Sehen wir vor uns nicht nur die leidende Wirtschaft, sondern ebenso die bedrohte Kultur. Nicht nur die Not des Leibes, sondern nicht weniger die Not der Seele. Und wir können uns keinen Wiederaufstieg des deutschen Volkes denken, wenn nicht wieder es steht, auch die deutsche Kultur und vor allem die deutsche Kunst. The art produced in Germany between 1933 and 1945 cannot be considered in the same way as the art of other periods. It must be seen as the artistic expression of a barbaric ideology. One can only look at the art of the Third Reich through the lens of Auschwitz. For the National Socialist regime, culture was a key word. Art was considered one of the most important elements in the creation of the new Reich and of the new man. Its aim was to impose a national socialist philosophy of life. Political aims and artistic expression became one. The Nazis discovered that art could not only carry a political message, but that it was also a perfect tool for manipulating desires and dreams. The purpose of art was to shape people's outlook and to control their behavior. The Nazis were masters at inventing stereotypes and art forms which replaced genuine artistic and personal experience. They removed the individual's desire to question and to probe. A total submission to a state aesthetic. Hitler believed that only the Aryan could produce and appreciate culture. The Aryan's task was to implant new culture in the rest of mankind. This Aryan art was meant to abolish class distinction and bind the nation together with common dreams and shared ideas. The opposite of the shining Aryan was the dark Jew, uncreative, driven only by thoughts of making money. The Jew was the arch enemy of culture, the parasite, devoid of any idealism, the man without cultural roots. <laughs> Hitler linked Jewishness with modern art. It stood for the big city and decadence, capitalism, internationalism, homosexuality, Bolshevism. 
<laughs> the function of art, in Hitler's own words, was to create images which represented God's creatures, not miscarriages between man and monkey. Statements like this one illustrate how art, too, was mobilized to decide who had the right to live and who had to die. In true German art, there was no room for the woman represented as a femme fatale, as she-devil or whore. In the eyes of the Nazis, modern art was the betrayal of national values by decadent artists and greedy international art dealers. In the feature film, Venus on Trial, which ridicules the art establishment, a young Nazi sculptor has to prove that his work is not an antique, but his own. It's a is dieser Busen gemeißelt, wie wahrhaft gekonnt der Halsansatz, oh, und der vollendete Schwung der Hüften. Das Werk eines großen Könners, das muss gesagt werden, auch wenn wir heute eine ganz andere und viel geistvollere Auffassung von der Kunst haben. Abschließend erkläre ich, der Angeklagte ist ein weit unter dem Durchschnitt stehender Bildhauer. Ich als Kunstsachverständiger empfinde die Annahme, er könne der Schöpfer dieser Statue sein. Einfach als absurd. Der Stein, aus dem sie gemacht ist, ist uralt. Und dass die Zerstörungen an der Figur von meiner Hand stammen, das konnten Sie weder ahnen noch feststellen. Und warum sind denn die Herren Sachverständigen überhaupt nicht auf eine solche Idee gekommen? Weil so eine Figur in der Gegenwart gar nicht entstanden sein kann. In der Gegenwart entstehen andere Kunstwerke. Ein moderner Künstler würde eine Frau doch nicht so darstellen. So hat man die Frauen doch schon vor ein paar tausend Jahren gemacht. Wo bliebe denn da die neue Kunst, die zeitgemäße Einstellung? Heute verherrlicht man nicht mehr den schönen Körper, sondern den hässlichen. Man geht neue Wege in der Kunst, wenn man eine Frau als Gorilla-Weibchen darstellt. Das ist modern, das ist geistvoll, das bringt einen Namen und vor allen Dingen Geld. The Nazis also took good care to link modern art with the exploitation of the poor. Germany had just come out of the most horrendous inflation in its history. With unemployment topping six million, hardship in the cities was extraordinary. It was an easy task to represent the city as sterile and chaotic. The country was a wholesome and fertile paradise which appealed to those living in the dingy courtyards of the city with no prospect of work and without hope. Na, was kickst du, Kleiner? Kickst wohl nach die Sonne? Sonne gibt's hier nicht. Love of nature and the simple life existed long before the Nazis adopted them as key elements. Hordes of young men and women hiked through the countryside, singing German Volkslieder about an imaginary Germany which embraced the heroic and the traditional. To a nature-loving and for the most part provincial people who long for the good old days, modern art, modern architecture and the byproducts of decadent city life were disturbing. They smacked of revolution and of the destruction of the old order. The call for a firm hand became louder. It was easy for Hitler to exploit these feelings. 
Art tried to recapture a mystical, idyllic past and its traditions, which for many were the only way of resisting the chaos of modern life. Everything that smacked of Nordic or Germanic origin was dragged out and used in the rewriting of history. The Nibelungen, the Holy Wars, the Reformation, Dürer and Holbein. Everything was designed to lend authority to the new system and give it an eternal and spurious history. Old customs and old songs were taken out of context and readjusted to promote the dream of an idealized Germany. New German art was seen as a great renaissance and the man responsible for it was the new messiah, Adolf Hitler. Sie leben heute als Künstler in einer großen und glücklichen Zeit. Sie sehen über sich einen Mann als Führer von Volk und Staat, der zur gleichen Zeit auch ihr mächtigster und verständnisvollster Beschützer ist. Er liebt... Der Führer liebt die Künstler, weil er selbst ein Künstler ist. Unter seiner gesegneten Hand ist nun über Deutschland eine Art von neuem Renaissance-Zeitalter angebrochen. Man möchte fast in der Abwandlung eines Wortes von Ulrich von Hutten ausrufen, O oh Jahrhundert, O oh Künste, es ist eine Lust zu leben. It was Dr. Joseph Goebbels' role to interpret Hitler's cultural program. He was the most educated of the Nazi leadership. A writer and a journalist, he became Hitler's minister for propaganda and enlightenment. He began his post by an ignominious act of cultural vandalism. Deutsche Männer und Frauen, das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. Und der Durchbruch der deutschen Revolution hat auf dem deutschen Weg wieder die Gasse frei gemacht. I consign to the flames everything that is un-German. The writings of Karl Marx and Trotsky for decadence and Marxist corruption. Thus we reinstate discipline and morality in family and state. I consign to the flames the writings of Heinrich Mann, Ernst Glaser, Erich Kessner for lack of conscience and political treason. The Nazis lost no time in cleansing the German arts. The list of people who were deprived of their jobs and had to leave fills pages. A few names stand for many others. The musicians Arnold Schoenberg, Hans Eisler, Kurt Weil, Bruno Walter, Otto Klemperer, Fritz Busch, Arthur Schnabel, all went. The writers Thomas Mann, Bertolt Brecht, Stefan Zweig, Franz Werfel. The German theatre lost Leopold Jessner, Max Reinhardt, Erwin Piscator, Elizabeth Bergner, Peter Lorre. The cinema, Billy Wilder and Fritz Lang. Pictures by Max Beckmann, Paul Clay, Otto Dix, Max Ernst, Vasily Kandinsky were removed from museums. the impoverishment of German cultural life was staggering. Having got rid of the opposition, the Nazis began their seduction. In order to put their cultural politics into practice, they set in motion a complex propaganda machine which reshaped the cultural landscape of Germany from the printed page to the Autobahn network. Art was taken to the people. Good, solid German art, that is. Orchestras played in factories, with Beethoven, Brahms and Wagner featuring heavily in the programme. The music of Jewish composers like Mendelssohn had of course been banned.
Teutonic values were not only stressed in the music, the listener too was the hearty, honest German type. The central role of art in Nazi politics made it attractive to many. It gave it a human face. People closed their eyes to the violent aspect of the regime and wallowed in its artistic window dressing, the bloodless takeover of a nation's entire culture. Small towns without a theater suddenly saw actors, many in jackboots, erecting a stage in the main square. Theater was no longer for an intellectual elite, it was for everyone. No one should, or could, opt out. Strength through joy, Kraft durch Freude, was the party's way of even organizing people's spare time. Workers traveled for a fraction of normal fares and stayed at reduced rates in special hotels. Tourism, which had been the preserve of the rich, was now for all. Party-sponsored mass tourism included visits to the theater and to concerts, accompanied by the indoctrination of the travelers with racial and political ideas. <laughs> Nazi culture appealed to popular taste and prejudice and could therefore count on solid support. Here was a man who had the answer to everyone's problems. Things were going to be different. The real horrors were drowned under a mass of festivals and folklore. People withdrew into moral indolence. Life for most of them was much better than before. Having organized people's spare time, the Nazis also set about improving their working and living conditions. The Department of Beauty and Work was founded. It was in favor of green spaces in factories and campaigned for better light, better work. Propaganda films compared the poor conditions of the past with the beautiful ones to come. They skillfully used simple and emotional images. Through cultural changes, Hitler wanted to create the new man. He rarely promised a higher living standard, but a better way of life. A life filled with deeper meaning. It all looked so civilized. There were modern canteens, complete with the bust of the Führer, and some German art. In the guise of social improvements, the government set about controlling people's tastes and attitudes. They were to run along the same lines as the arts. Simplicity, traditional values, a design for the people. Zweckmäßig und schön ist die Einteilung der Wohnräume. 
Ebenso zweckmäßig und schön die Einrichtung. The new homes are functional and beautiful. Their furniture too is functional and beautiful. Designs by the Ministry of Housing that everyone can afford. The many social services were meant to give the impression that Hitler cared for the well-being of the individual. They suggested the right porcelain, the right wallpaper, and the right spirit. All aspects of life were gradually subordinated to political ends. Nazi doctrine began to appear in almost every painting, film, and public building. in children's toys, in storybooks and costumes, in the layout of villages, in the songs and poems taught in schools, even in household goods. The cultural infiltration of every sphere of life ticked away like a time bomb. Sometimes subtle, working on the subconscious, sometimes crude, working on fear. It never stopped until it had brainwashed almost a whole nation. At the center of these cultural activities stood the healthy and clean area. Physical exercise and dance took on a kind of messianic fervor. Here as elsewhere, the individual was absorbed into the group. Folk dances were Hitler's answer to the nightclubs of the city. Musical comedies with their giant staircase became the model for the orchestration of mass meetings. They helped to realize the Nazi dream of turning Germany into a dancing, exercising and marching nation. In September 1933, Goebbels founded the Reichskulturkammer. It was the central organization responsible for the control of the German arts. With nearly all cultural activity under his control, Goebbels became the second most important man in the land. Within a short time, the Reichskulturkammer included 100,000 members, among them 15,000 architects, 14,000 painters, 3,000 sculptors, 6,000 designers, 2,000 publishers and art dealers, and thousands and thousands of writers, filmmakers, actors and musicians. The organization of professionals working in the arts into these cultural chambers guaranteed the political streamlining of all artistic life. It guaranteed that the arts would follow and express the philosophy of the party. To abstain spelled the end of a professional career and a life in oblivion or exile. Germany was hermetically sealed from the culture of the rest of the free world, but this did not prevent a delegation of French painters and sculptors from visiting the Nazi's major artist, Arno Brecker. His guests included André Durin and Maurice Vlamanck. It was a large-scale sellout by intellectuals to a political system based on ideas that were both narrow-minded and trivial. Their behavior was a mixture of cowardice, opportunism, and political blindness. Some were simply sucked in by the regime. When they awoke to reality, it was too late. Hitler had always been in love with Munich and his mistrust of Prussian intellectualism made him shift the art scene from Berlin to a more conservative city. 
Hitler saw himself as the successor of King Ludwig of Bavaria, who in the 19th century had made Munich into a cultural capital. Wir schicken nun der Gedanke vor, im Einvernehmen mit dem Führer, München wiederum für seine Kunst ein wirklich würdiges, großes, neues Kunstausstellungsgebäude zu geben. Ich bin sicher, dass sich die Stadt München mit aller Kraft dafür einsetzen wird, ein neues Kunstausstellungsgebäude so bald wie möglich wieder erstehen zu lassen. Ich werde nun unserem Führer Bericht erstatten von unserer ersten Sitzung und vor allen Dingen wird der vom Führer aus der Seene Baumeister, unser Herr Professor Trost, sich an die Arbeit machen, um einen der Kunststadt München würdigen Entwurf für das neue Heim der deutschen Kunst zu gestalten. Ich danke Ihnen, meine Herren. Herr Ritter. Das war die Geburtsstunde des Hauses für deutsche Kunst. And so was born the House of German Art. If Hitler saw himself as the Bavarian king, Paul Ludwig Trost considered himself the new Klenzer, King Ludwig's great court architect. Trost, a distinguished Munich architect, was commissioned to build the party's first official buildings on the Königsplatz, as well as the House of German Art. Trost's neoclassical style was typical of the new architecture which aimed at permanence and tradition. Ein Haus der deutschen Kunst soll erstehen. Junge Deutschland baut seine Kunst, sein eigen Haus. Wenn es aber diesen Bau der deutschen Kunst der Stadt München gibt, bekennt es sich zum Geiste desjenigen, der einst als bayerischer König diese Stadt zu einer Heimstätte der deutschen Kunst erhob. Wenn ich heute in stolzem Glück mithelfen kann, diesen Grundstein zu legen, dann hoffe ich damit, dieser Stadt und dem Lande den Weg zu weisen in die Zukunft. Der Stein ist gelegt. What the newsreel tactfully censored was that the hammer broke. Not a good omen for the future of German art. One year later, Hitler's favorite architect had finished the temple of new German art in the bombastic, neoclassical style the Nazis preferred, and the whole government showed up to open it with pomp and Nazi circumstance. If there were any doubts about the direction the cultural politics of the Third Reich should take, they were resolved with the opening of the first exhibition of German art in Munich in 1937. It was open to all artists of German nationality and race. 16,000 works were submitted. 900 went on show. The selection was based on Hitler's taste. He rejected 80 pictures as unfinished. As in politics, so in the world of art. We're determined to sweep away chaos. Ability is the necessary qualification for those who want to exhibit here, was his verdict. From an early age, Hitler had vowed to dedicate his life wholly to art. He had a talent for painting and drawing, and as a young man, never tired of sketching theater buildings, museums, and castles. From the start, his approach to art was totally conventional and full of prejudice. His pictures lacked originality, but he was a competent copier and pastiche. He reveled in the neoclassical facades of Vienna and continually drew architectural subjects. Despite frequent praise, Hitler decreed in 1937 that no one should write about his paintings and forbade any exhibitions and sales abroad. He probably realized that the quality of his art was incompatible with the vision he had of himself as the great artist statesman. Hitler also drew tanks, battleships, and stage sets. He designed Nazi flags, the masthead of the party newspaper. 
He also boasted that everything which made the Mercedes beautiful was based on his ideas and that the Volkswagen Beetle was his design. Furniture and cutlery for the Reich's Chancellery were also designed by him. The official exhibitions of German art reflected Hitler's taste. They were supposed to be the mirror of the new nation and its new values. It was basically a reworking of old-fashioned types and techniques. Straightforward realistic subject paintings were easily overlaid with propaganda messages. They were easily readable and universally understood. They were also popular. Hitler's favorite painters were the painters of the 19th century, Ferdinand Waldmüller, Wilhelm Leibold, Hans Thoma, and Karl Spitzweg. For him, the Romantic movement expressed everything which was true and real in the German character. These 19th century genre paintings and the world they captured were not only preferred by Hitler, but also by most art-loving Germans. Many still believed in a wholesome Biedermeier world of provincial coziness. Modern art had only a handful of defenders and many adversaries. For most people, art had to please. The Nazis didn't invent a style, they just occupied those which existed. Many realist painters had continued to work in the old styles. They too resented the modernists who stole the headlines and got high prices on the international market. Many felt that art was moving further and further from ordinary people. Hitler's presence was greeted as a healing process, a way out of isolation and as a chance for art to communicate with a larger public once again. The making of art was as important as the diffusion of it. Art was regularly reproduced in books, magazines and in cinema newsreels. The official arts magazine, Art in the Third Reich, whose cover combined the Nazi insignia with the head of Athena, spelt luxury and trustworthiness. It exclusively reviewed the works of artists featured in official German exhibitions. Hitler became their best client, spending large sums of money. In 1941, he bought nearly 2,000 works, which he then distributed throughout ministries and public buildings. The label, purchased by the Führer, was highly prized. Hitler was quite lenient about artists' party membership, as long as they delivered the art he wanted. Once the official market was established, there was no need for strict guidelines. The opportunism of artists worked by itself. Landscape paintings predominated. It was the one kind of painting artists could produce without being too subservient to Nazi theories. Sometimes the addition of the word German to the title, German soil, German oak, was the only visible link with the system. The title gave the painting its political direction. But nature was not only a peaceful antidote to city life, it was also the arena in which the strongest could dominate the weak, in which the elements ruled and where animals themselves shared in life-giving forces. The eagle, the lion and the bull were therefore frequent subjects. Images of the countryside promoted peasant life as wholesome and strong with its pious bonds of family, native soil and blood. And the expression of a generalized racial type naturally discouraged any feeling of individuality. A picture of uncomplicated, decent people, clean and natural. Aber wir selber sitzen schon über 300 Jahre hier auf der Scholle. 
300 Jahre, das ist aber viel. 500 müssten es werden, 1000! Despite the increased mechanization of agriculture, the farmer was mostly shown working in the most primitive conditions, sowing, plowing, mowing the grass with a scythe. The eternal repetition of the farmer's work was treated as a quasi-religious ritual. All work was done by strong arms, tough bodies. The problems of modern industrial society didn't exist. It was a world ennobled by hammers and muscles, not a world of sweat and exhaustion. It's still hard to understand how these naive, even primitive themes could so easily be sold to a technically advanced urban society in the first half of this century. Help with the harvest is a magnificent innovation. It mobilizes all available young men. In this way, these comrades in work learn about their country. The Silesian works in Bavaria, the Berliner in the Rhineland. Thus, the day of work helps to forge the nation together. There were some industrial paintings but the worker was often omitted, or so small that it became just a prop. Instead, the miracle of the great Autobahn network and the building site itself were to be celebrated. Where the worker is seen, he is a hero with tools, emblems of victory. We conquer land from the sea. The reclaiming of land and the draining of swamps became favourite subjects. They were celebrated in painting, song and film, ceremonial reiterations of the same theme. National Socialism considers the family the cornerstone of the state. The family that is not just parents and children, but is everything which has spiritual value in the nation. The farmer and his family were seen as the nucleus of the nation. Father and mother, the pillars of the family, preferably with several children, happy, in harmony, fertile and in tune with nature. The restful compositions and symmetrical design of these paintings, with their frozen gestures, were supposed to evoke feelings of stability and universal truth. They were not realistic genre paintings in the 19th century tradition, they were especially designed to carry messages. Most of those portrayed were not real people, but stereotypes of racial perfection. No display of any social conflict was allowed to disturb this dream. Pictures of a life free from worry. Art became the ultimate lie, presented as eternal truth. If Hitler was seen as the untouchable, the man who shunned drink and women, Goebbels, with his six children, represented the family man. This film was made as a present by newsreel cameramen for Goebbels' 45th birthday. Weil du meist fort in wichtigen Sachen und oft nicht weißt, was wir da machen, soll dir dies Buch nun all das zeigen, was hier geschah im bunten Reich.
Portraits of the party bosses were popular. Of course, Mrs. Goebbels had to be seen in a ladylike pose. The Nazis saw themselves as a feudal caste. Their increasing wealth allowed them to imitate the lifestyle of the upper middle classes with their own large villas and country estates. Art had to define the social role of woman. The female equivalent of the role of the hero was the woman as the safekeeper of life, an object to be admired, to be fertilized. Man dominated nature, while woman represented nature herself. Woman was the beauty of nature, or the playfulness of nature, and of course was as fertile as nature. If most male images showed little individuality, the representation of woman was even more stereotyped. Young women offered their naked bodies uncompromisingly to the spectator's gaze. Such perfect bodies have an air of unreality. A Venus with a permanent wave, as if she'd just emerged from the hairdresser or been sunbathing. Titles such as Abandon, Mourning, spelled out the role women were expected to play. Adolf Ziegler was one of the most reproduced artists. His triptych, The Four Elements, hung in Hitler's rooms. Four priestesses sitting on a bench as though on an altar, ready for sacrifice. The willingness to be sacrificed for the nation did not apply to men alone. Gradually, however, an increasing number of lascivious nudes came to be exhibited too, and these were eagerly bought by the Nazi leadership. A sign of increasing decadence at the centre of an inflexible regime. The deutsche Kunst is in the grip, sich zu einer wirklichen Darstellung leidenschaftlich bewegter Weltanschauung emporzuheben. Die Tendenz eines edlen und heroischen nationalen Wollens steht ihr auf der Stirne geschrieben. Unterdes aber wollen wir die großen Werte echter deutscher Kunst an das Volk heranbringen, auf dass das Volk wieder zur Kunst zurückfinde. Das deutsche Künstlertum aber insgesamt verneigt sich in Ehrfurcht und Dankbarkeit vor dem Führer, dessen künstlerischer Dämon der deutschen Politik den mitreißenden Zug und dessen Politik der deutschen Kunst den leidenschaftlichen Impuls gab. Portraits of Hitler, of course, formed an important part of the fine arts. Unapproachable, he was never shown at home or relaxing. He was seldom painted with other people. The full-length figure symbolized his divine role. A seated portrait would have looked too relaxed and familiar, unless it were formal and enthroned. Hitler, the icy statesman, the artist, commander-in-chief of the army, always authoritative, sometimes pensive, gazing into the distance. Hitler in the pose of the victor, the map of the world at his feet, the bunker in the background. All these made wonderful postcards. They were sold by the million. Except for the obvious party portraits, there were relatively few overt political subjects. Paul Matthias Padua's painting, 
the Führer Speaks is in the tradition of the genre paintings of the 19th century. If you remove the Hitler portrait, the radio and the fascist newspaper, it could hang in any museum. The Seven Deadly Sins looks harmless enough until one spots Chamberlain and Churchill as examples of gluttony. While cartoonists and filmmakers indulged in orgies of anti-Semitism, we find very few traces of it in the fine arts. In house and home, Jewish developers trick honest Germans out of their belongings. But on the whole, art was to concentrate on the good, and the good had to be beautiful, and consequently there was no place for the Jew in it. He would have debased German art by his presence alone. present is working on a new type of human being. A new type which we watched emerge before the eyes of the whole world at the Olympic Games. In its shining, proud, physical strength and beauty, it is the model of our age, Adolf Hitler. With architecture, sculpture became the most visible expression of Nazi ideology. A more public art form than painting it was better at expressing the idea of race and health and did so in a more lasting material. These self-conscious sculptures played on feelings of eternity and of tradition. They were modelled on antiquity, messengers from a perfect world. They defined the image of the new German race, Nordic equivalents of the Greek gods. In these pin-ups, the private world of muscle magazines was put on public display. In edlem Anstand reitet der Jüngling auf seinem amphibischen Pferd. The young man rides with dignity on his watery steed. Es wirft der Seemann das Korn. The farmer sows the seed for corn. The soldier mourns the death of his comrade. The speaker persuades with the power of his word. Artists proclaim manly strength and manly thought. My artists shall live like aristocrats, Hitler had said, and the leading artists of the Reich did precisely that. The giant so-called state studios were built for Arno Breker and Josef Torak, the regime's leading sculptors. Here, Torak worked on his gigantic sculptures destined for the Nuremberg Stadium. This is where the master of the largest studio in the world does his work. From clay figures, mechanical enlargements are made many times their original size. And here one can tell if it succeeded without losing intensity. So 
Colossus upon Colossus awaits its final resting place upon Germany's buildings. Arno Brecker was the regime's most popular sculptor. His work adorned the major party buildings. He was an artist of undoubted ability, a follower of Rodin and Mayol. Under the influence of the Nazi aesthetic, he abandoned the sensitive surfaces and individual expression of his earlier portraits and developed a declamatory, bombastic style. His particular contribution to the orchestration of power was to give a refined expression to brute force. In these early heads, one can see Arno Brecker's great talent for portraiture. They reflect a deep sympathy for his sitters. They are full of feeling. Now, a change in outlook replaces the feeling for the individual by one for what is universal. Hardness has replaced sensitivity. Deep shadows extinguish the play of light. These heads are not about individual men. They proclaim, I am the concentrated strength of all men. I firmly resist cowardice. I hate the enemy of my people. Be like me. Art has changed. The present has become a monument to eternity. Times are hard. The sword decides the destiny of nations, and art itself is a political gesture. Das Werk des Künstlers wird zum politischen Bekenntnis. The war absorbed most of the country's vitality. It had never curtailed the regime's manipulation of people through the fine arts. The popularity of the official annual exhibition did not diminish either and attracted up to a million visitors. Das festliche Haus der deutschen Kunst even in the war, the House of German Art opens its doors. The whole country takes part in this act of creation. Young and old, people in all walks of life, find the art which speaks to their heart. Junge und alte Menschen aus allen Schichten eilen sie herbei. Jeder findet ein Werk, das zu seinem Herzen spricht. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels sagte in seiner Dr. Goebbels said that the making of culture in wartime is a sign of our undiminished strength and security. Art is the eternal and unchanging expression of our national will. Als der ewige und unveränderliche Ausdruck unseres völkischen Lebens. Despite the fact that art was forced on a large number of people, no new art emerged there was no renaissance. Most paintings, architecture and films were pitifully mediocre. Every proclamation, every building, everything told the same story. The real art was done by those Germans who'd bravely turned their backs on a regime which betrayed humanity and civilization. Some hoped that the war would generate a new kind of painting. But the war paintings were just as undemanding and full of stereotyped cliches as the genre paintings. In any case, aesthetic judgments are impossible. We cannot look at the art produced in the Third Reich objectively. Our response is overshadowed by what we now know. Artistic and political content remain inseparable. And this is precisely what Hitler intended. What is so frightening about the art produced under him is its banality, its ordinariness. And that is what attracted so many. The masses and the leadership evidently share the same tastes. Art finally revealed its real purpose, 
Again and again, the soldier is shown as the ideal German. In his readiness to fight and die for the nation, he displayed the highest virtue. The suffering of war or even death was only rarely portrayed. The readiness for sacrifice was the only thing that mattered. In the beginning, art had synchronized the masses into marching behind the Führer. It now invited the whole nation to die. A group of soldiers are lost behind enemy lines. They're saved by one of their own. the whole country in ruins and millions dead, feature films like this use the German arts to foster and authorize yet more self-sacrifice and destruction. Anna!